Welcome everybody to another Textile Talk. I'm Martha Seelman. I'm the Executive Director of Studio Art Quilt Associates. And uh, we are currently uh, looking for great ideas for new Textile Talk presentations. So if you're interested, please go ahead and go to saqa.com slash calls um, and tell us your new idea because we'd love to hear from you. Um, I wanted to do a couple things before we get started with uh, today's presentation, which is uh, three of the artists from our current uh, global exhibition called Haven. One is to just tell you a little bit about Studio Art Quilt Associates. Uh, we are a membership organization of people who are passionate about the art quilt, either as makers or collectors or curators. And we'd love to have you join us. Um, you can go to saqa.com and read all about membership and um, be part of our wonderful community of slightly over 4,000 uh, people around the world. We'd love to have you with us. If you become a member, one of the membership benefits is that you're eligible to enter our calls for exhibitions like this one, Haven. Uh, we currently have two open calls that we're really excited about. One is um, in collaboration with the National Basketry Organization. We're doing a collaborative exhibition of art from both organizations, and it's called Art Evolved Intertwined. And it's looking at how different kinds of fibers all intertwine together to create beautiful artwork. The other call for entry currently open is for one of our virtual galleries. Um, this is free to enter for members. And the one that's um, open right now is called Reflections on Spirituality. So if that's a topic that interests you, we encourage you to check out saqa.com slash calls and um, see if this is a good fit for you. We'd love to hear from you. So Sakwa puts on about five or six new global exhibitions every year and then travels those, travels those exhibitions for around three years to venues, museums, and quilt shows around the globe. And um, Haven is one of those. Um, and we're really excited about the quality of the work and the poignancy of the messaging that um, the artists have created for Haven, which will be premiering at the International Quilt Festival in Houston in November. And I hope that you have the opportunity to go and see the exhibition in, per in person, because as you know, there's nothing like being in the same space with a piece of beautiful art. So um, today we've invited three of the artists to tell you about their work, about their practice, about their inspiration. We'll be hearing from Anne Bellis, Yata Clover and Helen Giglio. So um, I'd like to start by inviting Anne to tell you about her practice, her studio and her inspiration for her art that will be traveling with Haven. Anne, can you turn on your video and microphone and away you go. Well, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Good. Well, I'm kind of intimidated because, uh, well, I'm the one to start, first of all. And secondly, it's an international audience, so it's not my mother tongue, so I'll do my best. Uh, hello, everyone. I don't know whether I should say good evening, good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you are. I want to thank you, Marta, for invi inviting me and Lucy for your technical help. Um, so I am Anne Bellas, I'm French. I live in Nantes, a city in the west of France. 
Uh, I'm at the mouth of the Loire River near the Atlantic coast, so not very far from the ocean. Uh, you can see that on this picture, um, it was taken uh, during a local radio uh, recording at the station and uh, the, I, sh I was showing my Notre Dame piece in 2018. It was my first attempt at quilting a cathedral and then I didn't know that I would make a whole series um, three years later. So, uh, on next please. Yes, this is my cathedral that's, that was selected for Haven. Uh, it was selected, it was created this year, as you can see, and, uh, well, you can have a look at it. Uh, it's the second of a series of five so far. I'm cur currently working on number six and number seven. And uh, I am not sure it's the one I prefer, but I like it. Next, please. This is my workspace. Uh, it's a small 95 square feet bedroom uh, in an apartment in the center of the city. Uh, and small means organized. So uh, yes, can you work on the video? Thank you. So uh, there's on the first wall, Ikea bookshelves for fabrics sorted by color value, commercial ones, also uh, printed and self-dyed ones, cutting table, well, it's going much too fast. Um, on the second, on the opposite wall, you can see my uh, computer books, my design walls, scraps by color, and uh, a cupboard for having my quilts and uh, not, last but not least, the blessing of a small but very necessary laundry sink, which I need for dyeing. You may think it's very small, but I don't care. I have it and I can use it. Next, please. Uh, I taught languages all my life. I have no art background. I'm self-taught completely. I retired six years ago and started quilting from scratch in 2016. And I started with three traditional bedspreads for my children. And after three, I decided I didn't want any rulers, no patterns. And so one year, year later, I started art quilting, and these are my first two pieces. I was a bit bold to start with that, but anyway, next, please. Uh, I knew right away from the start that I was a piecer and that color was my world, my strength. I had to immerse myself into very happy, bright colors. Just to tell you, for example, these two were made just after my father's death. And uh, although I was grieving, I thought uh, beautiful, bright, shiny colors would be a good counterpoint to dark times and to grief. Next, please. In 2019, I started investigating small series. I didn't know yet that series existed, but I, I kind of intuitively started uh, making the same one, one in full colors and the other one in, uh, ver in the black and white version. I couldn't keep out all colors I've, after some, a lot of black and white, I had to add a couple of color spots. Otherwise I, was, I felt like I was dying. Next, please. I wanted to try fusing. And what you see here is the first, but also so far the only piece that I fused. After a workshop with Sue Benner, uh, I decided that fusing was not my cup of tea, although it's interesting, but I am a piecer at heart, definitely. Next, please. This was made during the first 
strict lockdown, which means in March or something like this of 2020. And uh, it was the beginning of the pandemic. It was also the first piece that was selected for an exhibition. Uh, and also the first one where I consistently used my self-dyed fabrics. And it was selected for Wide Horizons, the uh, European Sakwa exhibit. And I was a regional exhibit and I was very happy about that. Next, please, Lucy. Uh, now come three, uh, three quilts that I made during the lockdown. Uh, we couldn't go out and I made several pieces that showcase the window theme. I didn't know why I started from absolutely intuition. And then very soon I noted that I was representing dark indoors and joyful outdoors. And since we could not go out, I understood psychologically why I was doing that. Uh, next, please. And this one as well was done exactly at the same moment. Next, please. Exactly at the same moment also, another window. And the three of these uh, were selected for various venues, uh, both in Europe and in the United States. Next, please. This is, this search for openings for windows led me to two series in 2021. There, I really wanted to, to start with uh, series and uh, I made, well, the first series, window view series, I made about 25 of them in very different moods and different colors. Next, please. And the second series I made has also about 25 pieces so far. And uh, they are, I tried a new technique, piece, piecing, but also stretched on, on canvas. Uh, and I think the result uh, is quite pleasant. At least viewers uh, like that. Next, please. In 2022, so this is now this year, uh, I joined the International Artist Group 20 Perspectives. Uh, it was created in January. We are 20 uh, international artists, artists, and this is our first topic, uh, which was bridges. I made two of them. Uh, they were The 20 pieces were shown in Germany this spring and will tour the US with the Mancuso show in September, and it will stay there for one year. So. I'm happy it will be shown in the United States. Next, please. This is the second topic. We make one every four months. And this was portal. The group decided the, te the theme would be portals and windows. And it was so much in line with my window series. I just had a lot of fun making it and it was a joy to participate. Next, please. These are pictures of the uh, of the uh, fabrics that I dye. Next, please. And that I print in different ways. Next, please. And all of these are dyed and printed from a reserve of cotton and linen sheets and tablecloth that I inherited last year from my great grandmother's dowry. All these pieces are absolutely clean, beautiful cotton, and they're about 130 years old. I'm very, very grateful and very proud of being able to use those. They die beautifully. Next, please. Now I'm getting to the haven piece. I mean, the uh, cathedral of the 100 uh, moons. I called it that way because the first one I'd called the 1000 suns. It was a bright, uh, bright yellow and orange colors. And this one I decided would be for the night. So it was pretty obvious I would play with moons. So you, you can show, 
I wanted to show the process, how it was created. It starts from uh, the rose window and then tried several windows, then added some background, but wasn't happy with the color, tried different colors, uh, experienced difficulties with the portal, which I changed several times in color, in shape, in, in space. And um, after, well, about 120 hours of work, this is what I got. Of course, I'm not counting the time to dye or print the fabrics, but uh, the result is pleasing to my eyes. Next and last, please. Well, I wanted to show you the two cathedrals next to each other. They, they complement each other, I think, very nicely. Uh, day and night, and both uh, used, I used uh, my self-printed and dyed fabrics. Well, next, please. Thank you for your patience. I hope my English was up to the task and that you could understand everything I was saying. I, I hope you will have some questions and I'm giving the microphone to Yeti. Thank you, Anne. Hello, everybody. And thank you very much to Martha and to Lucy for inviting me to come and talk about my work and for the technical assistance. Um, I was born and raised in Copenhagen, Denmark, but I have lived many years in the US and in the Netherlands. And since 2005, I live in Belgium. I had, um, next slide please. I used to have a very big studio, but two years ago, we moved to a smaller house with no separate studio space. So instead of now, I have like a wooden garden house out in the backyard. It's not very big, but it works and it smells very nice. And when I paint, I can put uh, the fabric outside. Uh, next slide, please. This is a piece that got jurid into the Haven exhibition. It's called Stitched Dialogue. It's rust printed, discharged with flower paste and hand-stitched lettering, and then machine-stitched. Almost all of my artwork is text-based. I started out as a journalist at a new daily newspaper in Copenhagen, uh, but then I met and married an American musician and moved to America. I fell in love with quilts when I saw my first army's quilt hanging on a clothesline in my husband's hometown in Indiana. But I didn't stop right away. We moved to California and there I did not pursue any writing professionally, but I got to experiment a lot with textile techniques. And, um, and then I got a degree in art history instead of. But I still love letters and words, both because of their graphic forms and their ability to convey meaning. Writing and communication continue to be my main source of inspiration. Next, please. I'm drawn to the public language in the urban landscape from overlapping and torn posters, notes of missing pets on telephone poles, political slogans and cryptic graffiti. Next, please. Text is everywhere in our daily lives. Think about packaging, labels, street names, advertisements, magazines, newspapers, and of course the internet. I work with both uh, paper and fabric. They're the two most familiar materials in our daily lives. And recycling them uh, connect us to a personal and collab collective uh, history. And both are carriers of text. Next, please. I did several colorful city pieces. Here's one example called Downtown. That was number five. It's using both the overlapping and torn posters and the graffiti. 
I've been using my thermal facts a lot, making screens from my photographs uh, in the city and from handwriting. I bought it in 2001 from a tattoo parlor in Los Angeles. And I'm afraid of that it's kind of on its last leg now. Uh, but I have a lot of screens, so I'll be okay. My chosen medium is collage. I work very spontaneously, responding to my materials, which are usually cotton, linen, cheesecloth, and paper. For me, the physical, for me, creativity is a physical act. The gathering, the cutting, the tearing, and the patching is really essential for me. My, um, my journalist days uh, were pre-computer time, and I wrote on an old typewriter with no possibility for corrections. So I would print out my type pages and cut and recut and paste and end up with meters long patched pages. And I honestly think that this way of writing was the beginning of my love of collage. Next, please. Here's a detail from another series that I called Letter Landscapes. Here I'm using actually fragments of posters that I picked up from the street. The challenge for me was to see if I could combine paper and fabric to the point where you couldn't tell which is which. I covered the paper with acrylic gel medium and stitched over it. So the paper is completely protected and rather flexible. When I lived in Florida, I was overwhelmed by the light and the strong colors. And I started to work monochromatic to kind of find myself. And I still prefer a limited palette. Next, please. I'm from the north of Europe and I'm fond of misty gray window light and subtle colors. I often work with white, gray and black with accents of red and yellow, as you can see here in a piece called Metropolis. Next, please. This is uh, another detail, uh, like a wink to my journalist days. It's called Yesterday's News, and it's all in black and white and with some red accents. Next, please. Here's another detail called Yellow Wall. Um, I photographed a poster of Marlon Brando's Godfather, and then I made uh, screens of it. And uh, I wanted to show the repetition of an image that you often see plastered on city walls. Next, please. I'm always striving for less is more, which is not always evident in my pieces, but I keep striving. One of the ways is to limit color. For several years, I have explored the color white. In my series, White Wall, I sort of erased my printed and screened text with white acrylic paint. I then sent certain areas to reveal what is underneath the surface and thereby simulating the effect of time and the elements as seen as, <coughs> excuse me, on distressed walls in the city. Afterwards, I attached other pieces of text, mimicking the gluing of new posters over old ones and tagging of fresh graffiti over old statements. Next, please. My series words is an homage to handwriting. I use lettering as a graphic element and explore the impact of intimate letters blown up to the size of posters. Strips of torn fabric visually allude to the linear construction of handwriting. I borrow the use of white from the Japanese culture, where white symbolizes sorrow, to express my personal sadness of handwritten letters and penmanship gradually being replaced by keyboards and screens. The original meaning of the words are less important. The suggested meaning is connected to the human desire to leave a trace, 
making a mark to make one's presence known. Just as we know it from handprints in prehistoric caves, hearts and initials carved on a tree trunk, or political and social messages spray painted on abandoned buildings or on trains. Next, please. Besides the bold lettering and graffiti from the city, I also treasure old handwriting, handwritten letters and documents, which I find at flea markets, very often in discarded uh, books. In the beginning, I copied them and made thermofax screens of them. But now I use the real thing with the help of gel medium, as you can see here in open book, with the pages of, um, yeah, of, of uh, school books where you are learning calligraphic uh, writing. I'm finding it silly to save them because they probably only will end up in another flea market when I'm not here anymore. Next, please. But I have also used my own diaries, such as notations. I partly paint over the writing because the literal contents is not important. I cover the pages with acrylic gel medium, which also partly smears the ink a bit. And then I stitch over it, usually by machine, because it's very hard to sew by hand, unless you use an awl to stick holes in first. Next piece. I'm always working in series, both bold size and small intimate pieces, sometimes as small as four inches by four inches. During the pandemic, with no exhibitions and my workshops being canceled or postponed, I made one small series after the other, all very quiet, very intimate pieces in white and neutral colors and with handwriting on and stitched by hand. This is from the series called Whispers, and this is nine by nine inches. The next slide uh, is from another series called Messages, and that's actually four by four inches. Next, please. Over the years, I have used a variety of surface design techniques and many different writing tools to apply text onto fabric. But I'm now also stitching words by hand. In this piece, in other words, uh, you can see the hand stitching. It's a much slower process, but one that is closer to the rhythm of writing with a pen on paper. It feels great to have found an even closer relationship between writing and textile. And the last uh, slide, please. This is a detail of my Haven piece, Stitch Dialogue, where you can see that I'm stitching words by hand. Thank you very much for listening. And I will leave it now to Helen Giglio. Hi, thanks, Yeta. And thank you for this opportunity to share my work with you today. Um, let's go to the first slide. Um, for the past few years, I've been working on objects of protection and the theme of the Haven exhibit, a place of safety really spoke to me. And this is the piece that will appear in Haven It's called Anxiety Shield Vigil. And this piece is shaped in kind of the long full body shield of the Norman soldier in the Bayou Tapestry. And it was a long kind of protective piece. Um, the piece is, is made of repurposed fabrics and is heavily stitched by hand. Um, this part, This piece is part of a three quilt series of anxiety shields that I made um, right around November of 2020. We were waiting for a vaccine. 
Um, we had experienced a divisive and contest contested election here in the US. And I was feeling a lot of anxiety as were many others and experiencing sleepless nights and circular thinking. So I started making these quilts. Um, let's move to the next slide, which is a detail. As you can see, um, every, every bit is stitched by hand. It's very densely stitched. I don't plan the stitches ahead of time. These are pretty improvisational. And um, I rely on just a couple of basic stitches, running stitch, back stitch, and a, a French knot or two. I included some buttons in vigil. Um, but the actual process of doing this much hand sewing um, turned out to be very protective for me. I was able to process some of my feelings and um, calm some of my anxieties. It was a very restorative process. Let's look at the next slide. These are the other two quilts in that series. Unlike the Norman Shield of Vigil, these two are a more heraldic um, King Arthur's style shield, but that shield shape is gonna um, appear in all three of the works. And they share a color palette and similar um, fabrics. Um, I, I felt like making these was a way for me to move through a very difficult time in our collective lives together. And so these anxiety shields um, represented that haven or safe place to me. Let's look at the next slide. The summer prior to making my anxiety shields was the first summer of the pandemic. And my friends were making sewed um, face masks and I started making armor. So these are um, breastplates. They are made out of uh, linen tea towels that I backed with cotton and using dressmaker techniques formed into a bodice shape. I then added darts and tucks to create kind of a shape. Um, they're dyed with rust dyes and solar dyes and they also have um, things applied to them and lots of embroidery. But um, I then put some fabric stiffener on them and molded them over a torso form, a plastic torso form. And so these are three-dimensional and they're life-size. I could wear one. And there are 15 of them. So that whole summer I was making these protective, this protective armor, kind of representing women's fortitude in difficult times. The whole series is called Women's PPE, Personal Protective Equipment. And I think they represent strength and resilience. Let's go to the next slide. During the past years, I've also been making a series of cloaks in wool. I call them wisdom cloaks. And these are large pieces. And again, I feel like this is a protective garment. The focus of the wisdom cloaks is on the wisdom and knowledge, particularly of older women. As we get more experience, we have this wisdom. And Mender of Rifts, the one in the slide, is particularly focused on this idea of the possibility of repair. Finding the wisdom to mend our relationships, to heal wounds, and to maybe stitch across a divide. Let's see a detail of this, this piece. Um, as you can see, these are also densely stitched. The wisdom cloaks are all made with felted repurposed wool, usually with a linen or a cotton backing. And um, again, you can see that I've got kind of a vocabulary of stitches that I use and reuse. And just a technique note, the little needles in here are children's uh, plastic needles that I've couched over with pearl cotton. So that kind of created that needle and they're a little bit 3D as well. Um, the wisdom cloaks also have charms and objects sewn into them and um, kind of protective symbols. Let's see the next slide. Um, the last slide I'm going to show you is um, 
some work that I've been doing recently. These are called amulet bundles, and they are also protective objects. These are focused around motherhood. Um, there are almost meditations on motherhood. And they're formed around children's board books, so that'll give you kind of an idea of the size. I used some items from my collection, handmade doll clothes or infant clothing. And then I wrap them around the board book with strings and ties and stitches and created this bundle of protection. I think that in many ways as a parent, and I'm sure other people can, can kind of resonate with this idea, we try to wrap our worries and our concerns for our children, wrap them tightly into a bundle and tie them with protective layers of cloth. And so these bundles represent sort of that process of wanting to keep our children close and at the same time knowing we need to let them go. Um, so those are the, the kinds of things that I've been thinking about during the last couple of years. And it is just a pleasure to have a piece accepted for Haven. I thought it was a good match for my thinking in these last, last past years. And um, I look forward to, to that exhibit. Um, I also would like to thank you very much for the opportunity to present my work today. It's been a pleasure to be here with the other artists. And thanks to Lucy and Martha as well. So that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Um, Anne and Yetta, if you could turn your videos and microphones back on. Um, that was wonderful. Uh, so very different in the type of art that you're creating and where your inspiration um, came from. And um, I want to let everybody know in our audience that all of the images for the Haven exhibition are on Sakwa's website. You go to sakwa.com under art is um, a link to all of the exhibitions and you can see all of the pieces there if you'd like to study them in more detail. Um, so I have a lot of questions for the three of you. Um, and um, Anne, I wanted to start by asking you about the fact that you are clearly a very organized person. <laughs> and, um, and so your, your uh, fabric is organized, your space is organized, and you also seem very drawn to working in series, which I think of as a very organized way to be creative. Could you talk a little bit about um, that part of yourself and why you're so drawn to working in series? Well, the organizing mind, I didn't choose. It's like when you have a very small space, if you are not organized, you can't do anything. I mean, in 95 square meters, I could not dye, print, sew, computer work, etc. if I was not organized. So it's not a choice, it's a must. Now for the series, I discovered them about, well, two or three years ago, I started thinking, well, I want to have the same piece in different colors or in different moods or in different shapes. And that's how it started with these two pieces I showed, like, like one was bright colors and the other one was black and white. And then uh, the window series, I just thought, you know, when someone's looking at, not at a window, through a window, well, when one is in, indoors and looks outside, depending on your mood or on who you are, on what your history, your past is, whether you've been fighting with your husband or whether you've just been selected for Haven, 
uh, what you see through the window is not the same, not the same colors and not the same pictures. And I thought I'd like to show that, to show that people are different, that uh, the same or different people looking through the same window will not see the same thing. And that's what I try to show in the, the cathedral series mm -hmm. is exactly that. And of course, I'm not comparing with anything like Monet, but of course, all of you, each of you knows that he had the same cathedral in I don't know how many versions. And I, I didn't choose it. It just dropped on me. And suddenly I was with a couple of cathedrals with, before I knew it. <laughs> Now, I mean, now I'm, I'm really proceeding and, and, and making new ones uh, purposely. But at the start, I didn't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's sort of like collecting. Um, yeah. You know, you, you buy something you like and then you buy another thing that you like. And before you know it, you're getting pushed out of your space. Yata, you also clearly work in a variety of different series. Um, can you talk a little bit about the change that you went through from doing the series that were based on the torn posters and the series that you've been doing recently, which is made up of stitched writing. Oh, there's actually quite a lot of years in between. Mm -hmm. you know, like, mm -hmm. And I said that um, when I lived in Florida, it was just overwhelming, you know, and in order to sort of find myself, I I had to get into some minimal uh, thinking. And uh, so I did a series in yellow, and then a series in red, then a series in blue, then a series in rust. And then when we moved back to Europe, I thought, oh, I'm going to start a series of white, and I'm going to take pictures of snow, and I think, well, it didn't snow at all that year, so <laughs> I didn't, but I still really enjoyed working with white. And um, I think I'm also become more quiet and the pandemic certainly um, made me feel like I'm, I, I couldn't go outside and I didn't have any exhibitions and no uh, uh, teaching, mm -hmm. but I really enjoyed being quiet and and just working and also feeling very blessed that uh, I had something to do you know like um, so in the beginning and the first lockdown certainly felt like a blessing uh, um, of working quietly and uh, not being distracted mm -hmm. and I think when yeah I always work in series because it's never enough to do one piece. Um, I just and also when you are dyeing fabric and printing it, and think you just you have so much of it, so <laughs> you want to kind of try a different way. And while you're working, I'm just always thinking, what if I did it this way, or what if I did another color? Mm -hmm. um, so it feels like a very natural way to work. I'm not in a hurry, you know, and. Uh, um, <laughs> Yeah. And, and Helen, uh, you also are working in series, um, but it's clear that for you, the pandemic was did not feel like a blessing. It felt um, anxiety producing and scary. And so you created a, several series of protective either breastplates or shields or amulet bundles. Um, and are there multiples because you also wanted to explore other forms or because you needed more protection? <laughs> Maybe both. Yeah. I think, you know, um, Yetan and have both, both talked about this. When we, when we reach a decision point, we make a decision. In a series, we have that opportunity to go back to that decision point and take the other way. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's really interesting. And a lot of times I have so many materials and things that are suggesting new ways that I have to try them out. And so, yeah, the, working in a series just makes sense for me. And I think for me, it was really important to just be very busy and very intent because mm -hmm. slowly making all those stitches was very protective for my mental health. Mm -hmm. And 
I, I think that the question that I then have for you as a follow up is um, you talked about the stitching being um, what really helped you to calm that anxiety. Um, so do you feel like that process was really important or is the final product more important? You know, I always like to have a finished piece, mm -hmm. but really the process of doing is what, what I'm in this for. I, I, I enjoy making things and actually doing that is very satisfying. And, and then we have a couple of technical questions. How um, do you display the breastplates? Are they mounted on pedestals? That was tricky. Okay. <laughs> that was tricky. I ended up putting um, those D rings that you use on a canvas stitching those to a piece of felt and attaching them to two corners. Okay. They have to be hung in two places. All right. That, that, that was tricky. That works. Um, Yetta, the, the question for you is, um, you mentioned using flour paste, and one of the people in the audience wondered if you could explain what that is. She's never heard of it. Oh, okay. Yeah, you make uh, like sort of a pancake batter just with flour and water, it has that consistency. Then you paint that over uh, the whole fabric. And then when it's dry, you can crumble it. And then uh, you paint over it with another color, with black or green and thing. And then you can just wash the flour um, out. So and it then acts as a have, resist. Then you have kind of like a crackly, kind of like from batik effect. But you can also, instead of crumble it, you can also scratch in it and write in it, for instance, which is a little difficult, but um, you can definitely make scratches in it. So it has a lot of possibilities and you can use it with, um, yeah, with discharge too. Mm -hmm. So starting out with a black uh, fabric and putting the pa flower paste over that. And then when it's dry and crumbled, you know, you put um, thickened uh, bleach out mm -hmm. over it and then you can just wash it off and it's just mm -hmm. very organic and um, and it has this surprise that you never really quite know so yeah I, I, I tried it once it was very messy but it was a wonderful effect <laughs> try it again and, right. it'll be less, and it'll be less messy <laughs> okay and and the question that came in for you was you're working with piecing do you do your piecing by hand or by machine? 100% machine. I am so lazy that if I can spare two stitches I will by hand, I will spare them. I'm not like Helen. Uh, it's like, it just for me, a waste for me. I'm not talking for other people. I do not need that kind of protection and time thinking that Helen needs, obviously, mm -hmm. and that yet he also needs. I, I just run into it, run into color and, and no hand stitching except the borders behind because I cannot do it otherwise. But my machine is a domestic machine. Oh, you can't see it here, but well, nearly you can see a little it. Bit. Just yes. a small domestic machine and it works beautifully. My best friend. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, Michael Cummings described his work with his machine as dancing with his sewing machine. Mm -hmm. um, then my, our last question for each of you, and I'll start with Helen, is what advice would you give to somebody who is just starting to make quilts? Dive right in, dive right in, do some sampling, try a lot of, a lot of techniques and uh, don't worry too much about what the back looks like. <laughs> you know, give, your, give yourself a little space to make mistakes and experiment. I think that's, that's good advice for anyone. Mm -hmm. And Yetta? Work every day. Just make sure that you have have your materials in your hand, even if it's only 15 minutes. I I definitely think it's so important to be in touch with your artwork every single day and and make a lot of work and throw it out if it doesn't work. But uh, 
yeah mm -hmm. yeah don't be too serious about it just try it out mm -hmm. something good will come out mm -hmm. yeah. and well i absolutely uh conquer with yeti i mean uh i think it was picasso said uh you make i think he said like 10 pieces and perhaps one of them will be a success not a masterpiece but a success of course if you work every day you will make 10 pieces and you might have one successful piece mm -hmm. if you make one a year well i don't think whether you can get a success before the end of your life so <laughs> just make 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 and i i am on a, of a different kind helen i i would not advise to try all the techniques that you can because i'm not i go deeply into one technique or two and i'd rather go on that so my my piece of advice would be be bold be bold just cut take your cutter and just cut the um the fabric somebody said why are you so afraid of cutting fabric the only thing you can be afraid of is to die <laughs> so oh there you go <laughs> <laughs> cutting fabric bold. no problem <laughs> and work every every single day <laughs> uh well thank you all so much um to our viewers um all of the works are going to be shown in the slideshow again so stay tuned and if you enjoy textile talks please consider making a donation to help support the costs of putting on these talks because we do them every week and they're free to the public the total cost to the organizations putting them on is around forty two thousand dollars and we are very lucky to have our generous sponsors, but that doesn't quite cover all the costs. So if you can make a donation, we really would appreciate your support. And in the meantime, relax and enjoy seeing all the works in our slideshow and check them out in more detail on the website, sakwa.com slash art. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.